Welcome. You're listening to Living Faith Podcast. Starry sky and see your hand in time in mind to lead me through the night. But there's something special that happens when we come together. Now we have the opportunity to be his bride. And we cannot do that individually by ourselves. But when we come together, when we gather and sing songs of worship to him, we become his bride. And while there's tremendous blessings and favors and intimacies we can have with God as his children, there's a deeper level of favor and blessing that we can have with him as his bride. So neglecting, the fors- forsaking the gathering of ourselves together is, is a, just a losing a benefit and a blessing that we can have. And I am thankful that we have gathered here because we have become his bride in his presence today. Timing is extremely important in everything in life. If we was to ask the professional athlete, they would absolutely speak of timing, that you have to get up to the speed of the game. Or perhaps thinking of baseball, it's about a batter or a hitter's ability to time the pitch that makes him successful. It's not just swinging the bat in the right plane of the strike zone, but it's the timing that has to be right and Different mechanisms are used by different batters to get the timing right and some with a leg lift to try to time their swing just as the bat, the, the ball would be in the strike zone. And if their time is right, there's a greater chance of them hitting the ball, perhaps a home run, double, triple, single. But if their timing is late, they shank the ball foul. Timing too early, swing and miss or pull the ball foul. Timing. This is why the professional pitchers vary the speed of their pitches. And they throw, if they're so blessed, a 95-mile-per-hour fastball and then come with a 90-mile-per-hour slider. Change the speed so that it throws off the timing of the batter and then perhaps an 85 mile per hour change up so it's about timing athletes know this everything in life is about timing I I am definitely not a a very good cook but I do understand that it's more than just getting the right ingredients together but cooking good cooking is about timing it's about how long the oven is preheated and uh, just how long it's in the oven and when the ingredients are put together. Not just the right things, but the timing of how it is done. Everything in life is about timing. And if this is true in the physical realm, then how much more so is timing important in the spiritual realm? Throughout the scripture, we see individuals who knew their opportunity, their window of power and anointing from God and they receive miracles and blessings and strength for themselves, their nations, etc. But then others that missed their window of opportunity. Others that didn't understand the move and the timing of God and they missed their opportunity of blessing. Time is so important in everything in life. Very much so in our spiritual life. And if ever there was a scripture That was timing. It's here in John chapter 2. Timing extremely important to understand the context and the revelation of what John the revelator is trying to tell us here. Jesus is coming to church. It's the time of Passover. And he has come looking for something. Because when Jesus comes to church even today... He doesn't just show up to be present. He's always present with purpose. Too often we're satisfied to get in his presence and feel like that's enough. But if he's come to be here, he's here with purpose. So it's just as important to get in his purpose, not just in his presence. And so true to form, Jesus is here, John chapter 2, with purpose. He's looking for something. And I won't spend time on this, but if you look through the scripture 
Jesus is looking for particular things. He's looking for true worship. He's looking for faith. He's looking for sacrifice. He's looking for those who will invest themselves in these particular principles in the kingdom of God. And he's looking for something here for the scripture says that when he came to the place in Jerusalem in the temple, he found, he found. But what he found was not necessarily what he was looking for. For he found... Sheep, oxen, doves, and the changers of money sitting there in the temple. Now, that would seem maybe pretty strange tonight if you had to come through these doors and when you got into the auditorium, you looked up on the platform and here was the, meh, some sheep up here and there was some, that's a sick cow, but it's the best I got tonight some oxen up here and you heard the cooing of the turtle doves you yeah, I don't know what you think, you know, just a farm got loose in the church or maybe was putting on a drama or something but it would seem so out of place but in the timing before the Christ this was very natural more than natural it was very right it was in purpose. It's what the law had instructed them to do. Because if you wanted peace between you and God, in the times of the Old Testament law, you had to bring an oxen. And that oxen would be sacrificed for you and your family. And that sacrifice of the oxen would give peace to you and your family. The sheep was there, we know, for atonement. That the blood that was shed by that lamb would be an atonement for you and your family. The sins of you and your family rolled ahead until the time of Christ's crucifixion would happen. And this was proper and in place at that time. Even the turtle doves are given for those of less social status and standing. You can't afford an oxen. You can't afford a sheep. You, you tur turtle doves, one for peace and one for atonement. Everything is there, even the changers of money sitting, because Deuteronomy declares unto us, you travel long distance, you've got provision to bring your monies and to purchase the sacrifice. So everything we see here was right and in place up to that time but there is a destination that has happened to mankind there is a shifting of time that happened with the birth of Christ because now walking into their temple no longer would they need a sheep or a lamb because he was the lamb of God no longer would you need an oxen for peace offering because he is the prince of peace. He was the fulfillment of everything they had been sacrificing and looking for up to that time. But now that he was walking among them, he was there to fulfill. Not to destroy the Old Testament laws and the prophets, but to fulfill all the Testament laws, all the feasts, all the sacrifice. So in this understanding of timing, Jesus walks into the temple and he makes a scourge of small cords and begins to drive out the oxen, the sheep, the pigeons or the turtle doves and, and the, those that are setting, making change for the sacrifices. And the disciples that are there did not say, well, you know, Jesus kind of lost his temper that day. In fact, growing up, I was always bothered by this in Sunday school when I heard the story of Jesus cleansing the temple because I thought, man, you know, Jesus kind of got mad there. But I was always thinking, well, you know, be angry and sin not. That's out of context, by the way. But I always thought that, well, maybe that's what it was. You know, he was just. Uh, but those that witnessed this, the disciples didn't say, whoo, Jesus was teed off. It, they said uh, he was zealous. There was something passionate about him. He didn't lose his temper. He wasn't mad. He wasn't angry. But there was a zeal that rose up within him, a passionate that rose up within him. And we hear him saying a couple of things. Make not my house a house of merchandise, and my house shall be a place of prayer. Or make it not a den of thieves, my house shall be a house of prayer. We get a little clue about what's happening here. When Jesus takes the time 
to make a scourge of small cords and lifts it high to drive out their traditional worship and sacrifice. The only other times you see a particular, this Greek word, scourge, is when it's directly referring to Jesus going to the whipping post. And there he takes stripes to pay the price for what the kingdom of God will do in our lives. Isaiah prophesied of this when he said he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace is upon him and with his stripes we are healed it should have been a clue to those who knew the prophecy of Isaiah what he was trying to do that all the things that they had been doing in the past was just leading them up to what church was supposed to be he lifts up the scourge it should have been a clue it's about being wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities and taking stripes for our healing and as he drives out their old traditional worship if you will their old traditional ceremony their old traditional way of doing church he wasn't trying to destroy it he was trying to fulfill it make not my house a den of thieves There are many theologians that will suppose that there was double selling of the sacrifices. That individuals would come with their monies and purchase the sacrifice. But instead of that sacrifice being taken to an altar and blood shed for that individual, perhaps the money changers would sell the sacrifice a second time or a third time. Who would know? And it became a den of thieves. But I think it's saying more than that in context. I believe that he's saying if the purpose of church is for a place where miracles should happen, where the supernatural should happen, where the power of God is demonstrated, and we just go through our rituals and through our ceremony and steal from people the opportunity to be healed and miracles and families put back together and lives restored and deliverances happen, then we have stolen from them the very opportunity of what church is all about. Don't make my house. A den of thieves. Jesus begins to change the atmosphere of the place, driving out these sacrifices of Old Testament law. The disciples declare that the zeal of the Lord hath eaten me up. And as they are there with this change of destiny, this dispensation, if you believe in true dispensations, a a change that is happening, the traditionalists of that time begin to challenge the Lord. And they tell him that if you really have authority to do these things in church, give us a sign that you have this authority. Show us a miracle. Show us something From heaven, give us a proper sign that you have this authority. Literally, what they were saying is, let us see your badge. By what authority are you doing this? Give us a sign that you have true authority from heaven. That you're really here from God trying to do. Give us a sign. And Jesus speaks to them that there would be no sign that they would receive. Except for this. Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The traditionalists of that time were upset, indignant, full of wrath perhaps, because they immediately thought he's talking about the buildings. Forty and six years it took to build this building. And they're saying, do you know how many people sweated, sacrificed, Gave of themselves so that we could have this building. And you want to destroy this building? How dare you? Perhaps others there were thinking more organizational, religious sects. My father was a great, and my mother this, and my uncle that, and greatest people I know in God, and how dare you come in and make changes and shifts. But he wasn't talking about their physical building, the veils, limestone of their walls, 
He wasn't talking about their carpet and their pews and their paint. He, he wasn't talking about their physical building. He wasn't talking about their religious sect or organization. But he was talking about what house? The Holy Ghost. He was talking about his body. He was talking about the flesh that he was destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. So now we flash forward some three years, recognizing that the traditionalist of the church people, the temple, the tabernacle, the synagogue, early in the Gospels, Jesus visits them often. Early in the Gospels. Early in the Gospels, he speaks to them of the prophecies coming to pass, of miracles happen, of the supernatural. But when you began to see that those leaders and those individuals in the temples and in the synagogues began to rather embrace their old traditions rather than the fulfillment, then now you find Jesus doing miracles on the seashores and in the marketplaces. He went first to the church, but they were too in love with their tradition. Then he went to... (laughs) The people and the masses that were hungry and they were more willing to let faith operate in them for their blind eyes to be open, their deaf ears to be unstopped. They weren't so concerned that he was messing up their human made rules of Sabbath working. They weren't too upset that he was doing things that were anti-traditional according to the church of the day, but They were willing just to let the kingdom of God be fulfilled. And so he healed and he blessed and he provided thousands with lads lunches and raised the dead and and spoke healing to deaf ears and open blind eyes. And the kingdom of God now is happening everywhere else. Because seemingly the church just wanted their tradition more. And they wanted the fulfillment of the kingdom. So now it's Calvary time. And Jesus has made his way out to that skull-shaped hill of Golgotha. You know the story well how that he gave his life, shed his blood. And then he gave up the ghost. They took his body down from that cross and put it in a borrowed tomb. Three days later, the stone is rolled away. And victorious over death, hell, and the grave, Jesus resurrects him. But this is more than just the powerful kingdom of God being demonstrated. It's also more than just the salvation message being birthed for us to preach and for the disciples to follow in Acts chapter 1. But it is also the sign for every church he went into and tried to fulfill the purpose in the kingdom of God. By what authority do you have? Destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. It was the sign that he had the authority that church should never be the same again and all the traditional sacrifice not to be destroyed but was now fulfilled in Christ Jesus and what he demonstrated in the seashores and what he demonstrated in the marketplace streets and what he demonstrated beside the shores of Galilee now should be what happens in church. It's time, it's time for the miraculous. We are living in the time that the scripture makes very clear the last days. We are living in the time that the scripture prophesies of, of the last generation. Those on whom the ends of the world will come. We're living in the time of those that have been prophesied of the former and the latter rain together being poured out in this generation. And indeed, we are seeing that all over the world. According to some statisticians and some theologians, we are rapidly approaching almost one billion people who confess to have the charismatic Pentecostal experience of speaking in other tongues. We are rapidly approaching and living in that generation. But there are some prophecies unique to this generation 
that have never been completely fulfilled in any other generation before. There is some battles and there are some fights that other generations have fought, but never to the completion and to the fulfillment of the warnings and the prophecies of Jude and James like we are living in now. Even from the Old Testament, we find Daniel talking about this generation, that there will be a people that live in the time of the Antichrist spirit where wars and rumors of wars are on every hand. But these people will know their God and they shall be great and do exploits. That's the place that we are living today and never has this been fulfilled like that's being fulfilled today. Can you imagine how strange it sounded when the prophet Joel went through the city proclaiming, In the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. That sounded very strange in Joel's time. Because the, for the most part, the presence of God may be fell on a high priest once a year. And it also fell upon the prophet as he would come in and under the anointing prophesy. But that it would fall upon all people, that it would be poured out. That's a strange thing for the prophet Joel to be prophesying in the last days. And we see the beginning of that 2,000 years ago. But never has there been an outpouring like there is right now. Simon Peter picks up this prophecy when the Holy Ghost began to be poured out on the day of Pentecost. And he said not only will God pour out His Spirit upon all flesh, but then he began to even go further in the prophecy and declare that and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That the youth group, that the young people, that this generation would operate in the supernatural, would operate in the prophetic, that there would be a hunger among them, not just to have good church like we have traditionally had it, not even to have good revival or great harvest like we have traditionally had it, but to somehow come to a place of understanding that where we live now is not the time to keep doing what we have always done. And Please understand as I qualify, I'm not talking about doctrine. I'm talking about the fulfillment of the very purpose of what Pentecost is all about and that we have to understand that this is the time of fulfillment. And to some degree, we can even read in the book of Acts and the epistles how upon individuals. But I'm seeing something special in our generation as I travel around the world. God opens doors for me to be able to see powerful churches and groups of people even nations that are beginning to realize we have a whole lot more that we can have of God and a whole lot more that we can operate in God. Ministry that is not just natural, but absolutely supernatural. And that God, through the power of the Holy Ghost, will work through us supernaturally. And this generation is standing up to declare that you've got a dream. That you're not trying to deny the past. We know that we're standing on the shoulders of great men and women that have gone before us. We're respectful and we love and we honor those that have placed us to where we are today. But something within my heart and my spirit declares, hey God, I want every prophecy fulfilled in me. I want every promise that you have declared in your word to be a part of my ministry. I want to walk in it. I want to move in it. I want to flow in it. I want it all. I want the fulfillment. Prophecy, the sign rather that Jesus spoke to these at the temple. That if you think I have authority to do this, this is the sign. Three days after you destroy this temple, I will raise it up. But there has been an awakening in this third day, this third millennial since Pentecost, that is trying to stir upon us. And the church is resurrecting to its full potential and full power and full authority. And there's those among us who recognize it and hunger for it. Would you do this with me? Would you, all over the place, just close your eyes.
Just no one looking around. That's why I'm having you close your eyes. Let's, let's just take those sons and daughters. Let's, let's just cut it off at 35. If you are under 35 years of age and you desperately hunger for God to use you supernaturally, whether that's healings or miracles, signs and wonders or gifts of the Spirit, whatever it might be, you're, you're that age and you desperately hunger for that. No one's looking around. Just lift up your hand and let me see that hand up. Beautiful. Would you do this for me? Would you stand up? Would you stand up if you had your hand raised just a second ago? There we go. There we go. Now, church, you can open your eyes <laughs> and look around. I don't know who's under 35 and who's not, but it looks like everybody in the house. That's no accident. Because just stay standing. Everybody stand with us. That's no accident because God has put that hunger within you. And you are the last day church. And there's things that God is going to fulfill completely in you that has never been fulfilled completely before. However, we've got to get out of a traditional mindset and if it can't happen within the confounds of a church building then we've got to be desperate enough to let it happen in the marketplace and in the neighborhood but I know and I have strong faith that there are entire churches and organizations that are hungry for God and are crying, don't pass me by, God, in the fulfillment of what you are doing. We want the miracle. We don't want show. We don't want entertainment. We don't want man stuff and super stuff. We want God moving among us with his spirit and with his power. We want the real thing. And we want it all. We don't just want to somehow. Right now, with that hunger's rising in, you just lift up your voice and tell him that you want God to use you tremendously. Would you do that? God wants to do some impartation right now. So just put in and lift your voice and let that happen. You've been listening to the Living Faith Everett podcast series. Tune in next week for the next part of this series or join us online at livingfaithministries.church.